Tonight, the Facebook whistleblower demanding Congress take action. The social media giant now going after her. The former employee on Capitol Hill today alleging Facebook's business practices harmed children, stoked division, and weakened democracy, even going as far as comparing the company to big tobacco and opioid manufacturers, saying, quote, we have to protect the kids. Facebook now attacking the whistleblower's credibility, saying she mischaracterized documents she stole. Also, California declaring a state of emergency after more than 160,000 gallons of oil spilled into the Pacific Ocean. Crews skimming the water, trying to save marine life and wildlife. But environmental advocates warn irreparable damage is already done. COVID's new ground zero. The state seen a 100% rise in cases over the past two weeks. Hospitals now forced to ration care. Our team on the ground in Anchorage, Alaska tonight. Crossing the line, the new video of protesters confronting Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema in the airport and on a plane. Just one day after activists barged into a bathroom and filmed her. Her vote so crucial to her own party, how she's responding. Plus, the man who just beat Tesla in court. Why the company is now ordered to pay him more than $130 million. The former Tesla employee joins Top Story tonight. And flight delay. The passenger plane getting stuck under a bridge. We'll tell you how this happened. Top Story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story with Facebook fighting back the social media giant's scathing response to a whistleblower who testified on Capitol Hill. Former employee Francis Haugen before a Senate subcommittee today alleging the social media giant put its profits above all its users, especially young people, calling it, quote, disastrous for children, public safety and democracy. Haugen also calling on Congress to require more transparency from Facebook, saying right now it's accountable to no one. In a statement today, Facebook slamming Haugen's claims as inaccurate, adding that she did not work on the issues she testified about and had no direct reports. Let's get right to NBC's Hallie Jackson, who leads us off tonight on Top Story. Facebook under fire tonight. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. Whistleblower Frances Haugen insisting Congress must act against a company she says is misleading the public, promoting hateful and harmful content, holding its CEO to account. In the end, the buck stops with Mark. Haugen left Facebook in May, armed with tens of thousands of internal documents, including some, she says, showing the company knows its Instagram app can contribute to eating disorders in teen girls, a characterization Facebook has disputed. It's just like cigarettes. Teenagers don't have good self-regulation. They say explicitly, I feel bad when I use Instagram, and yet I can't stop. Um, we need to protect the kids. And to do that, Haugen says, Facebook must share more about its algorithms, which determine what content pops up on your feed, incentivized, she says, towards problematic posts. This inability to see into Facebook's actual systems and confirm that they work as communicated is like the Department of Transportation regulating cars by only watching them drive down the highway. From Facebook, an aggressive defense. And what you have here today is a former employee who didn't work on these issues and was just at the company a couple of years, uh, mischaracterizing some documents that she stole. It seems to me an attempt by Facebook to undermine her credibility. Is your strategy to, to go after the messenger and not the message? Hallie, my strategy is, and our strategy is to make sure that we're giving people accurate information about what we're doing. Facebook actually has been calling for regulation for more than two and a half years now. On regulating big tech, rare bipartisan agreement. After years of hearings, Congress calling yet again for changes. Those could include internal research released to outside parties, stronger federal oversight that demands transparency from big tech, or a requirement platforms share their proprietary algorithms with regulators. If Facebook is serious and honest, there will be legislation for them to support on privacy, on oversight, on protecting children. We'll see whether they're serious. I hope they are, because big tech is facing its big tobacco moment. It is a moment of reckoning. 
Hallie Jackson joins us now from D.C. And Hallie, I actually want to go back to that part of your story where Facebook actually went after their own whistleblower trying to yeah. say that she didn't have that much experience and she mischaracterized the actual thing she stole. That's exactly what they're trying to do. And what was interesting about that, Tom, is that was a really a shift in strategy from what you had seen from Facebook previously, right? Because remember, some of the internal documents that she had taken when she left Facebook ended up as the basis for some reporting that's been out for a few weeks. She did uh, 60 Minutes, for example, over the weekend. And you hadn't seen Facebook come out, um, you know, firing on all cylinders, if you will, Tom, against her then. That has changed today as they, they are, as you saw in that piece, working to, in essence, try to undermine her role or relevancy at the company, pointing out, hey, she didn't really work on this stuff. She was in a different unit, not the, you know, for example, kids unit. She was only at the company a couple years. You do have to note, though, Tom, when, when you talk about this, one thing that, that Haugen acknowledged in this hearing is that, sure, you know, I didn't work in that unit, but this research I'm talking about was freely available to employees of Facebook. She also in the hearing talked about her many years of experience at other tech companies working in this in this sector as it relates to engagement, civic integrity, et cetera. Tom. Hallie Jackson leading us off tonight. Hallie, thank you for that. For more on the hearing today, I want to bring in someone who has done extensive reporting on Facebook. Carol Callwalder is a journalist for The Guardian and is the co-founder of the Real Facebook Oversight Board. Carol, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. I want to start with Facebook's response to Haugen's testimony. You've dealt a lot with Facebook throughout your reporting. What do you think of the way the company is trying to discredit her testimony? Well, I mean, the particular Facebook executive who they brought out to try and discredit her this evening, I can remind you that she went out a week before we broke the Cambridge Analytica story and said that Facebook hadn't allowed Cambridge Analytica to abuse their data. I mean, that was comprehensively discredited. So, I mean, Monica Bickart, that is executive, she's a sort of Facebook cleanup woman who goes out to sort of drag out the bodies out of the way and to, to spray a bit more machine gun fire around to sort of create a distraction. So that she really does not have any credibility at all to speak here. And I think, you know, I think most people will judge for themselves is that, you know, Frances Haugen went out today and she was articulate, she was clear, she was very, very accessible. And I think that, um, you know, I think that everybody who saw that can make up their own minds, really. Carol, this isn't the first time a hearing has been held on Capitol Hill about Facebook. Is this any different? I think today was a really good day for democracy. I really do. I think that this hearing, it was... It, it just felt like a bit of a game changer, as if the reckoning for Facebook finally is coming. And I thought Congress, I mean, it was exceptional questioning. It was from both Democrats and Republicans. They were incredibly well briefed and informed. Compare what we saw today to a few years ago when Mark Zuckerberg took the stand and its polls apart. So I think... You know, we've all learned so much in that time. And I think now that, you know, everybody, you know, <laughs> Republicans, Democrats, Martians can see that there is a problem and something has to be done about it. OK, Carol, we thank you so much for your analysis. We appreciate it. We want to turn now to another major developing story that we're following tonight, that major oil spill in Southern California. Governor Gavin Newsom now declaring a state of emergency with the oil continuing to move down the coast and the damage to wildlife expected to grow. Miguel Almaguer on this story again for us tonight. Coated in crude, tonight the waters and beaches of Southern California show the stains of a slow motion disaster. State records now indicate the first reports of the massive oil spill came in the day before officials confirmed it. The size also larger than initially reported, up to 144,000 gallons of crude, and now potential evidence of an anchor strike. Contracted divers discovering a 4,000-foot section of the nearly 18-mile pipeline was displaced by over 100 feet, a 13-inch split cracking open the pipe, spewing oil. The pipeline has essentially been pulled like a bowstring. From just over the spill site, we saw how difficult the cleanup has become. Evidence from the spill stretches from the beaches of Orange County all the way to Mexico, but crews are having a difficult time tracking the ribbons of oil because they've been dispersed 
after a thunderstorm here. Today, a flotilla of boats are corralling the oil they can, but so far, just 3% of the spill has been recovered. Patties of tar are still washing ashore. The true ecological damage and the deadly impact to wildlife and the food chain may not be known for months. A lot of people think, well, some fish and some birds, but it's far more extensive than that. This is very serious. It, it's catastrophic. With the lawsuit just filed and likely facing millions of dollars in fines, the oil platform operator has still not confirmed if its leak detection system went off. With just over 20 offshore rigs dotting the coastline, many say a disaster of this scale was inevitable. Now there's renewed calls to shut down offshore drilling. We've had the entire Orange County coastline potentially fouled by oil. If that is not a call to action for us to stop this practice, I don't know what would be. Tonight, a push for change and the race to slow this seemingly unstoppable disaster. All right, Miguel Almaguer once again joins us from Huntington Beach tonight. And Miguel, a lot of discussion today focused on when the oil leak was first reported. That's right, Tom. We now know that first report of the oil leak was on Friday, but the Coast Guard couldn't find the source until Saturday. So that means for about 18 hours, tens of thousands of gallons of fuel was gushing and pouring right into the Pacific Ocean unchecked. Tom. Miguel Almaguer for us tonight. Miguel, thank you for that. Next tonight, as many states see COVID-19 cases decline, Alaska has seen a major spike in COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. The situation becoming so dire, hospitals are now forced to ration care. NBC's Ellison Barber reports from Anchorage tonight. Across the country, COVID cases and hospitalizations are dropping, but in Alaska, a very different story. These are people's moms, dads, sisters, brothers. For much of the pandemic, health officials say the state's geography was an advantage. Sparsely populated villages and strict travel restrictions kept cases relatively low. But now Delta is surging. Alaska's biggest hospitals are overwhelmed and the state's unique geography is working against it. We'll travel on average about 150 miles one way to access care. Our hospitals are hundreds of miles apart. To get them supplies and resources, anything from testing to oxygen can be a huge logistical barrier. Over the last two weeks, Alaska has seen the highest rise of COVID cases in the country. COVID deaths spiked 414 percent. Almost exclusively the patients that were meeting with COVID are unvaccinated. The state's crisis standards of care has been activated at 20 hospitals, including Alaska Native Medical Center, where some patients have been forced to wait days for beds. At this hospital, they can't let any visitors inside right now, except for very few exceptions. So we're going to go inside the COVID ward outside of the hospital. They're going to take us in through this video system, the same system that families use when they are talking to COVID patients who they are unable to visit. Nayrid Wells lost her best friend to COVID last year. Last week, her cousin also died. He wasn't vaccinated. I'm just so sick of people dying, you know. We've lost five family members. So she's urging others to roll up their sleeves, trying to curb the spread of COVID, now tightening its grip on Alaska. Ellison Barber joins us now from Anchorage, Alaska there. And Ellison, you spent a lot of time covering hard hit states like Mississippi and Arkansas. And this surge resembles what we saw in some of those hospitals earlier this summer. Tell us more about what you're seeing on the ground in Alaska. And is anything truly different? So the patients, the younger unvaccinated patients, primarily being the ones in the ICU, that is similar. The big difference here is honestly the outside issues, the terrain, the additional challenges they play, they face in a place like Alaska. This is a state where you have hospitals, communities that are not even on the main road system. The only way in or out for people or supplies is by plane, and that is truly unique to Alaska. An example of what that means in a COVID situation, you could have a village in the Alaska interior that maybe thinks they have an outbreak or a case of COVID-19, and they want to send out tests to see if they, in fact, have a positive case. That test has to get on a plane and then travel miles to a lab. They might not even know they have cases by the time they actually have an outbreak. Tom. Ellison Barber for us tonight from Anchorage. Ellison, thank you. And there is new fallout tonight from the sexual misconduct scandal rocking the National Women's Soccer League. 
Two former players now speaking to NBC's Morgan Radford, alleging a now-fired coach verbally abused and sexually coerced them. The stories are gut-wrenching. I want people to know that I was sexually harassed, that I was psychologically manipulated and abused. The women of U.S. soccer speaking out against Paul Riley, saying the former coach victimized them. Two of his former players, Mana Shim and Sinead Farley, breaking their silence, supported by their friend and former U.S. women's national captain, Alex Morgan. Mana, what made you speak out now? When Sinead told me her story, I immediately knew we had to do something. I called Alex right away and said, we have to push this story because it'll save people. Were you at all scared when you were told what had happened? In the moment, I was full of rage, but I immediately asked, do you want to file a complaint? She said, yeah. I said, let's do this. Riley denies the accusations, but has not responded to NBC News for comment. Former Commissioner Lisa Baird, who was alerted to the accusations in April and just resigned last week, now saying in part that she fought to enact initiatives that protected the women in our league. The commissioner has stepped down. Riley has been fired. Is that enough? No, that's not enough. There are open investigations. There are more investigations that need to be had. The league now says it has investigations opened into Riley's past and the league to undertake a significant systemic and cultural transformation. How does what happened to you still affect you and your life today? I carry it with me every day. It took away my career. I was never the same player. What do you say to all the little girls who are watching this unfold? I hope you're safe. We want young people and current players, future players, to be safe in the game of soccer. In the game of soccer and beyond. Tom, when I asked the women if they feel safe now, they said they do have hope for the future of the industry, but that as it stands currently, they feel like the league does not center the protection of its players. Back to you, Tom. Yeah, changes need to happen. All right, Morgan, we thank you for that. To politics now, President Biden is hitting the road this week, pitching his multi-trillion dollar agenda to voters in swing districts. But the president is still trying to convince some members of his own party to back those bills. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander reports. Tonight, the reset. President Biden at a union training center in Michigan trying to recharge his sales pitch for his multi-trillion dollar spending plans. These bills are not about left versus right are moderate versus progressive. These bills are about competitiveness versus complacency. But the reality check so far, the president's been struggling to unite those competing wings of his party. Though tonight, their differences appear to be narrowing. Progressives have blocked the trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill until they get an agreement on a much larger climate and social policy package. Today, key moderate Joe Manchin, who called that plan's initial three and a half trillion dollar price tag fiscal insanity, is now suggesting he could support a figure as high as roughly two trillion dollars that Mr. Biden has floated. I'm not ruling anything out, but the bottom line is I want to make sure that we're strategic and we do the right job. But Republicans argue the president's plans will send inflation soaring. Everybody is paying higher prices today for everything compared to when Joe Biden came into office. We're not going to rubber stamp their reckless spending. President Biden tonight bashing his critics. To oppose these investments is to be complicit in America's decline. Peter Alexander joins us now. Peter, as the president tries to unite the party behind these bills, and it looks like he's getting somewhere there with Senator Joe Manchin, senators remain deeply divided on how to address the debt ceiling, which we could hit in less than two weeks. What's the latest there? Yeah, that's exactly right, Tom. No movement today on raising that debt limit. Of course, the nation's ability to borrow money to pay for past spending. But late tonight, some new details. President Biden saying that he will be speaking with top Republican Mitch McConnell. Top Democrats, as we've seen, have been calling on Republicans to help here. But Republicans like McConnell, uh, McConnell have been saying Democrats will have to do it alone. Effectively, a political play to cause chaos for Democrats who control Congress and the White House. Tom. Peter, thank you. Sticking with politics tonight and the activists confronting Senator Kirsten Sinema, the senator approached at the airport, on a plane, and even in a bathroom. The protesters urging the moderate to fall in line with President Biden's agenda. But are they crossing a line? Here's NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. 
So then we want to talk to you real quick. Can we talk to you real quick? Hi, actually, I am heading out. Democratic uh, Senator um, Kirsten Cinema has a target on her back. And activists seem willing to harass her anywhere, including a bathroom. We knocked on doors for you to get you elected. And just how we got you elected, we can get you out of office if you don't support what you promised us. Back home in Arizona over the weekend, amid ongoing high-tension infrastructure talks, protesters demanding she relent on the hard line she's taken negotiating President Biden's signature legislative package. I need you to stand by workers. Cinema saying the incident was not a legitimate protest and accusing the activists of engaging in unlawful activities, including disrupting learning environments by entering Arizona State University facilities and filming in a bathroom. But that wasn't the last cinema would hear from voters. Flying back to Washington Monday. My family, I don't want to disturb you, but at the same time, I just want to see if you, I can get a commitment from you, Senator. It's really hard. And after deplaning. Senator, you owe us an explanation. Cinema, just one of the two moderate Democratic senators stalling infrastructure negotiations. The other, West Virginia's Joe Manchin, also confronted by activists, going to the trouble by kayak. Tax the rich! We're taxing the rich, I agree. We're going to make the rich and the famous pay. Democrats have been largely silent about the confrontations. President Biden downplaying the incident with cinema. I don't think they're appropriate tactics, but it happens to everybody from... The, the only people it doesn't happen to are people who have Secret Service standing around them. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's part of the process. Republican senators, though, springing to cinema's defense. Mitt Romney calling the confrontations harassment that are inexcusable and disheartening. And Senator Rand Paul said these things are wrong and they need to stop. <laughs> Paul, no stranger to an angry crowd. Last summer, he was swarmed outside the White House by protesters after a speech by then-President Trump. I truly believe this with every fiber of my being. Had they gotten at us, they would have gotten us to the ground. We might not have been killed. We might just have been injured with, by being kicked in the head or kicked in the stomach until we were senseless. In modern-day politics, in-your-face activism is nothing new. But in cinema's case, the protests may not have the desired outcome. The activists have to be recognized that they're walking a fine line on ensuring that cinema is negotiating in good faith and playing ball and to the point where they're not actually alienating her when she is the 50th vote in the United States Senate that the Democrats barely control. All right, Ali Vitale joins us now from Capitol Hill. Ali, great to have you on. And one of the people we saw in your report confronting Senator Cinema on the plane is now doing interviews. What is she saying? That's right, Tom. Karina Ruiz, who you saw in one of those videos, was on the Hill today protesting, continuing to pressure Senator Cinema. But she's also speaking out moments ago in an interview, saying that she felt ignored in that interaction that she had with Cinema, that her intention wasn't to make the senator uncomfortable, but that her intention was to make sure that she was heard. Tom? All right, Ali Vitale with that new reporting there tonight. Ali, we appreciate it. Still ahead tonight, the sister of Brian Laundrie calling on her brother to turn himself in, what she's now accusing her own parents of as Gabby Petito's family publicly addresses them for the first time. Plus, Capitol Hill takedown, the moment police arrested a suspect outside of the Supreme Court, what he allegedly told officers just moments before they moved in. And traffic jam, how this plane managed to get stuck under a bridge. We'll tell you, top stories just getting started. Stay with us. Back now with two new explosive interviews in the Gabby Petito case. Her parents speaking out for the first time about the lack of help they've received from Brian Laundrie's family, while his own sister urges him to come forward. NBC's Dasha Burns reports. Tonight, Gabby Petito's parents calling out her fiance's family directly for the first time. Anyone that lived in that house is a coward and they don't know how to stand up for their actions. Telling Dr. Phil they believe the laundries are withholding information. Somebody needs to start talking. I do believe they know a lot more information than oh, they're yeah. putting yes. out there. Earlier today, Brian Laundrie's sister speaking out as the search for her missing brother enters its third week. I hope my brother is alive because I want answers just as much as everybody else. Cassie Laundrie told Good Morning America she does not know where Brian is, but if she did, she would turn him in. I would tell my brother to just come forward and get us out of this 
horrible mess. But implying that her parents may be in a different position. I don't know if my parents are involved. I think if they are, then they should come clean. Cassie says the last time she saw or heard from Brian was on September 6th when their family went camping together in Fort DeSoto Park in Florida. NBC News reached out to the Laundry family attorney and he declined to comment. Now, a newly released 911 call with an Appalachian trail hiker on Saturday revealing Brian could be hundreds of miles away near the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. He was he was talking wild. He, told, he said that his girlfriend loved him and he had to go out to California to see her, but he was acting funny. And I wasn't sure about what he looked like. And then I got, I went and parked and pull, pulled up the photographs of him. And I'm 99.99% .99 sure that was him. The Haywood County Sheriff's Office in North Carolina saying the agency received several calls about Brian Laundry sightings over the weekend, though none have been confirmed. Laundry is a person of interest in the Petito investigation. There is also a federal warrant for his arrest in a fraud-related case. Laundry disappeared after coming home from a road trip without his fiancée, Gabby Petito, on September 1st. Her body was discovered in Wyoming almost two weeks later. Authorities ruled her death a homicide. Additional body cam footage from Moab police released last week revealed more information about a domestic dispute between Petito and Laundry. The footage shows an officer questioning Petito after police pulled over the couple's van. Petito told officers Laundry hit her, but that she slapped him first because he kept telling her to shut up. I slapped him. You, you slapped him first? And then what, just on his face? And he kept telling me to shut up. How many times did you slap him? And then what, and his reaction was to do what? All right, Dasha Burns joins us now and said, Dasha, I know our team also just spoke with Brian Laundrie's sister, and you have some new reporting tonight. Yeah, Tom, just before the show, one of our producers was able to speak with Cassie Laundrie at her home off camera, and I relayed a question to our producer that I wanted some clarity on. Cassie Laundrie says she and Brian and the family all camped together on September 6th, and I was curious whether the topic of Gabby came up. I mean, this was somebody who was going to be a member of their family. Our producer asked that question, and Cassie says that it's normal that Brian and, and Gabby would travel sometimes without one another, that they assumed Gabby was at a hotel or visiting family. They didn't think anything was wrong, so they didn't think to ask and reiterated that she simply, that, that topic just didn't come up and also said she really just does not know where Brian is, Tom. All so bizarre since they were in a relationship for That's so right. long. All right, Dasha Burns, thank you so much for that. When we come back, the movie that is going to be out of this world, the film crew launched into orbit today on a mission to make the first movie, get this, in space. And Tesla forced to pay the former employee suing the company for more than $130 million and winning in court. He talked to our Priscilla Thompson, who's on Top Story tonight. She joins us with more on his allegations, saying he faced rampant racism while working for the company. You're watching Top Story. Stay with us. We are back now with Top Stories News Feed, a roundup of what's making headlines across the country, and we begin with the arrest outside the Supreme Court today. New video showing Capitol Police using a flashbang to force a man out of an SUV. Authorities say he illegally parked outside the Supreme Court building and they told officers, quote, the time for talking is done. Well, police have identified the suspect as 55-year-old Dale Paul Melvin of Michigan. The Justice Department is reviewing its decision to not prosecute two FBI agents involved in the botched Larry Nassar investigation. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco told Senate Committee today, told the Senate Committee today, they will re-examine the case after new information emerged. The decision comes less than a month after star gymnasts testified about the agency's failure to act on their sexual abuse allegations against Nasser. A looming strike would shut down Hollywood productions indefinitely as the film industry tries to rebound from the pandemic. The union, representing nearly 60,000 film and television workers, has voted to authorize a strike. Negotiations have stalled for higher pay, better on-set conditions, and expanded benefits. It would be the first such strike in the union's 128-year history. And Volvo is recalling nearly half a million cars. The company says faulty airbags on older model vehicles could turn deadly during a crash, the recall impacting S80 and S70 
60 models produced between 2000 and 2009. More than half the vehicles were sold in the U.S. Next tonight, Tesla ordered to pay an unprecedented $137 million in damages to a black former employee who sued them over discrimination. He says he was subjected to relentless racism while at work. He spoke to our Priscilla Thompson. Like a way to listen off my shoulder. Validation and relief now setting in for Owen Diaz after a federal jury in San Francisco ordered Tesla pay him nearly $137 million for racial abuse on the job. Abuse that Diaz says is rampant. I'm just the tip of the iceberg. Diaz was contracted as an elevator operator at the electric car company's Fremont plant in the Bay Area for nine months in 2015 and 2016. What kind of harassment did you experience there over the course of the nine months that you worked there? The N-word scratched into the bathroom stalls. They were calling me a clerk's monkey and the Spanish version of the N-word. This other guy was getting on the elevator with me and he was uh, telling me, uh, you know, Ian, hurry up and push the button. You ends are lazy. Diaz says he became a target for write-ups after he began reporting the abuse. But it was after his 19-year-old son took a job at the factory that he decided something had to change. I was taking him lunch and he had a Caucasian um, supervisor um, Call telling him, uh, I can't stand all you F and N's. So at this point, my son was looking for me for help. At that moment, my son had saw him broke, break me. You know, I just have to live with that decision that I made to take him in that factory. It hasn't been a mistake I ever made in my life. Diaz and his son are no longer among the roughly 10,000 employees working at the factory. Tesla has denied knowledge of racist conduct at the plant. But this week, a jury awarded Diaz $6.9 million for emotional distress and $130 million in punitive damages. Tesla did not respond to NBC's request for comment. In a note sent to employees after the ruling, Tesla's head of human resources downplayed Diaz's claims, citing, among other things, employees who testified that racial slurs, including the N-word, were used in a, quote, friendly manner and usually by African-American colleagues, and that the company was responsive to Diaz's complaints, firing two contractors and suspending another, adding, quote, while we strongly believe that these facts don't justify the verdict reached by the jury in San Francisco. We do recognize that in 2015 and 2016, we were not perfect. We're still not perfect, but we have come a long way from five years ago. When you see Tesla's response, do you think they learned a lesson? No, it's another way of these companies, if they don't get their way of blaming the victim. All right, Priscilla Thompson joins me now in the studio, and there's a lot of questions about this because we are talking about a huge sum of money, but those allegations are horrific. Do we have any idea how widespread these allegations of racism are, and is Tesla going to appeal this? Well, it's unclear at this moment whether or not Tesla will will appeal. But in terms of how widespread this is, uh, we don't exactly know because, like many companies, Tesla handles these disputes via mandatory arbitration arbitration agreements signed by employees. So it often happens behind closed doors. Um, but what we do know is that there was an arbitration in May where an employee at this same plant was uh, granted one million dollars from Tesla because of similar racial discrimination being alleged. And there's currently a pending class action lawsuit against Tesla in California for, again, very similar um, issues. And now we're hearing from shareholders who are saying there needs to be an investigation into these mandatory arbitration agreements. We need to bring these issues to the light in order to correct them. Um, but Tesla has said that they want shareholders to vote against that change and that investigation into these agreements. And, of course, that meeting is going to be on Thursday, their annual shareholders meeting. And this is expected to come up. Some serious, serious allegations. All right, Priscilla Thompson. Priscilla, thank you so much for that. All right, and overseas now, we head to France, where a shocking new report has found that an estimated 330,000 children were victims of sex abuse within the country's Catholic Church over the last seven decades. NBC's Kelly Cobiella has the troubling details from Paris. 
Tonight, a disturbing spotlight on the Catholic Church in France. A new report detailing decades of sexual abuse by French clergy, both priests and nuns, and hundreds of thousands of child victims. Olivier Savignac says a priest abused him as a 13-year-old boy. Calling the revelations an earthquake, a hurricane. The new independent investigation of seismic proportions shaking the country of France with the extent of sex abuse within the country's Catholic Church. The commission estimates that clergy members sexually abused more than 200,000 minors over the last 70 years. And when you include minors abused by lay people, staff people, and school workers, that number could be as high as 330,000. The commission arrived at the number based on the testimony of numerous victims and research. In a statement released by the Vatican, Pope Francis acknowledged the abuse. His thoughts go to the victims with great sorrow for their wounds. Today's report for Catholics worldwide is another painful reminder of the work that still needs to be done. The reality is, it's not a thing of the past. It's a thing of the present. Parishioners have the opportunity to demand that truth, that transparency. Just 22 of these cases can still be prosecuted. More than 40 are beyond the statute of limitations, but involve alleged abusers who are still alive. Those cases have been forwarded to the church. The study's author said today these numbers are more than just worrying. They're overwhelming. He said they cannot go unanswered. Tom. All right, Kelly Cobiea from Paris tonight for us. Kelly, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, a look at what's making headlines around the world. The Taliban will resume issuing passports to Afghan citizens. In a first under the new Taliban rule, applicants will reportedly be provided with documents identical to those issued by the previous government. Passports had been suspended since the Taliban took control of Kabul nearly two months ago. Officials, though, say female employees will process passports for female citizens. To India, where a plane became stuck under a bridge for several minutes. This is a really wild video. It's gone viral. It shows the Air India plane underneath a footbridge in the capital city of Delhi. The scrap plane, which was sold by the airline, was being transported to its new owner at the time. All right, and Russia has sent a film crew into orbit to make the first movie in space. New video shows a Russian actress and film director at the International Space Station where they will film for 12 days. They launched into orbit from Kazakhstan today along with a Russian cosmonaut. The crew underwent a rigorous four-month training for the mission. Now we turn to the Americas, a look at the stories coming out of the U.S. and across Latin America. And tonight we are in one of the busiest and most dangerous migrant routes in Latin America. It's known as the Darien Gap, an unforgiving stretch of land tucked between the Colombian and Panama border. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Colombia at one of the last stops before tens of thousands of families brave the journey north. Tonight, what was once a sleepy beach town has exploded into the latest choke point in a worsening immigration crisis. Here in Necoclí, Colombia, there are now some 20,000 migrants mostly Haitian, though there are some Cubans and Venezuelans. The only thing more striking than the tents lining the beaches are the mothers lining up with their children. This woman, who named her daughter Hope, is hoping to make it to the U.S. Each day they cram together, passports in hand, in a desperate attempt to cross the bay. This is the moment when a few of these migrants are led onto this boat. Many of them have been waiting for this for weeks. Panama is only taking 500 migrants a day and more than 1,000 are arriving in this Colombian town each day, leading to a huge bottleneck. From here, the boats will take them west to Colombia's border with Panama. Then, the migrants will cross what's known as the notorious Darien Gap, a 60-mile roadless, lawless stretch of jungle run by smugglers. For some, this is as far as they'll go. Panamanian officials have recovered 50 bodies this year, but they believe the death toll is much higher. All officials can do is bury the bodies along with any information that can later identify them. Many migrants say the danger does not deter them. Here, we meet Pedersen, who told us he left Haiti more than a month ago after the earthquake. He hopes his final destination is Atlanta, Georgia, and he won't stop now. So why are they coming now? Several reasons. That recent earthquake in Haiti, worsening economic conditions in Chile, where many Haitians settled after the massive earthquake more than a decade ago, and a belief among some that the Biden administration might let them stay.
After a stunning surge of migrants into Del Rio, Texas last month, the Biden administration deported some to Haiti, but released the majority, around 13,000, into the U.S. to wait for asylum cases. Fritz Knorr hopes to make it to the U.S. too, with his wife and six-month-old son. He'd left Haiti years ago and settled in Brazil. Now he and so many others here believe the time is right to risk everything. In Necocli, shelter is hard to find. Hope is not. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Colombia near the Panamanian border. And Gabe, as you mentioned, this is the beginning of a very long trip north for many of those families. What are officials across Central America and Mexico doing as the tens of thousands of migrants make their way past their countries? Because as we can see behind you, Gabe, they are no longer in the shadows. Well, Tom, many of these uh, governments are having a very difficult time dealing with this increase in migrants. As you can see, these are these migrant tents have been set up here all along the beach. We have been speaking to some of them all day, and they will then board boats heading over the Panamanian border into a very dangerous stretch of jungle. But, Tom, these families say this isn't deterring them at all, and they're making this trip even with their children in tow. Gabe, as we see some of those young children there dancing, and we saw uh, what appears to be a mother maybe possibly preparing dinner tonight. How are these migrants getting supplies? Where do they use the yeah. bathroom? How are they getting by day to day? Well, Tom, you know, some of these kids are making the best of it that they can. And the families say that they're desperate, though. They're having trouble getting uh, food and water and also getting money wired here from other family members really across the world. It is a very difficult struggle for them to get supplies here. It's hard to find shelter. Some are here on the beach in tents. Some, if they have a little money, are trying to rent out some rooms in this town, which is normally a tourist town. But they expect to be here for at least several weeks, if not months. Tom? Gabe Gutierrez from Colombia tonight for us. Gabe, we thank you. Still ahead tonight, the shipping mess. Stores struggling to stock shelves as container ships remain stalled at U.S. ports. Our Tom Costello going on the high seas for Top Story to explain what's causing the record backlog. And those supply chain issues expected to cause a headache this holiday season. How you can get ahead of that Black Friday shopping. Vicki Wynn is in the house. Stay with us. Back now with an up-close look at why everything from LOL dolls to dresses from anthropology seem to be running out and getting more expensive. One reason? More than 70 container ships are stuck in a massive log jam off the coast of California. It's creating a supply chain disaster as ships from Asia simply can't make it into port to offload. And it's happening on both coasts. Tom Costello took to the high seas to explain what exactly is going on. <laughs> On the water with Los Angeles Port Police as the backup affecting the busiest port in the U.S. comes into view. From the air, a stunning 76 ships headed for the ports of L.A. or Long Beach now sit idle, extending 40 miles out into the ocean. Everywhere you look, there's a ship just sitting out here in the water. Just one clog in a supply chain that extends across the ocean to Asia, leaving some U.S. store shelves empty of key products, from toys to clothing, electronics to furniture to car parts. A typical ship like this carries as many as 14,000 containers, and in each container, about $100,000 worth of merchandise. But right now, these ships are sitting, going nowhere, stuck for 10 days. It's not just California. New York's ports are also backed up. Shipping costs are soaring, and there aren't enough truck drivers to move products off the docks. The problem, Asian manufacturing slowed to a trickle during COVID. Now it's struggling to keep up with America's exploding consumer demand. Gene Soroka runs the Port of Los Angeles. We're buying more products than ever before, whether they be online, pick up at stores, or at our big box retailers. And the American importer is struggling to keep up with that demand. 95% of the National Tree Company's artificial Christmas trees come from China. Now they're scrambling to stock up. Buy your Christmas trees now before Thanksgiving because otherwise the, the, shelves, the shelves will be bare and there'll be lots of out of stocks. Retailers who ordered back in June may be ready for the holidays, but many won't, with the supply chain expected to remain bottlenecked well into 2022. And Tom Costello joins us now from Los Angeles. Tom, you know, as reporters, we like to get out there to kind of understand stories and see things up close. <laughs> By seeing all these cargo ships up close and this log jam, what did you learn? Well, first of all, you know, if you've ever been next to or underneath one of these massive ships, 
uh, it strikes you how many stories tall they are, right? But as far as the eye can see out there on the water, there are more and more and more of these ships. Uh, if, as we said in the spot, 40 miles out, 76 ships, and they are, the numbers are growing by the day. But that equals to half a million containers right now sitting off the coast of Los Angeles. That doesn't count off the coast of New York and also, you know, what you've got right now off the coast of New Orleans. This is happening in every U.S. port, but L.A. is the biggest. And the back, uh, the backlog, if you will, the log jam really is very visual here. And, Tom, i got to ask you, so you have those 76 ships you're talking about. They're massive, as you saw up close. Who's playing traffic cop? How do they decide who gets in and who doesn't? That's exactly the question I asked, right? How do you prevent one from cutting them from the other one because they get a little bit antsy and they want to they move? They actually do have a system. And I was surprised it's not necessarily first come, first serve. It depends on, okay, what kind of containers are on your ship? How big is your ship? Uh, there are all these calculations that go into what product is on your ship, how quickly does it have to move, who has the, the trucks ready to roll to pick up the cargo because you can't just drop it on the, on the dock and leave, right? So all of that plays into this. So you could be waiting out there 10 days or longer. Somebody else could cut in front of you. But all of that is part of a very, very intricate, uh, almost like you call it air traffic control, but for the water. Tom Costello on the Maritime Beat for Top Story tonight. Tom, thank you. And that supply chain is affecting shopping all over the country. And the best advice experts are giving right now is to shop early. Amazon trying to tap into those early birds. NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn joins us now live to talk about these early Black Friday deals. Because here at Top Story, we're always trying to get you the top deal. Because who wants to pay more, right, Vicki? Nobody, not me, Tom. This is the year to make your list of who's naughty and who's nice <laughs> ASAP, or you could end up scrooged when the holidays come. Luckily, retailers are really trying to play ball and help you as a consumer. Target this year is launching its deal days earlier than ever, October 10th through 12th, on all of their platforms and in-store. Uh, Amazon right now introduced this holiday beauty haul event that started on Monday. It's going through the 25th. Deals on all kinds of things, from skincare to hair appliances, which can be expensive, or men's grooming. Tom, maybe this is the time to pick up that electric razor you've been wanting. These deals are going for 30% to 60% off, so a good time to shop. All right, Vicki, we love that. But, I, you know, I have to ask you, you know, what are the best deals that stand out right now? Because Black Friday, we know there's always like 100 things that are on people's shopping lists, but sometimes Amazon has the best deals that you can find anywhere else. There are so many, and it's really hard to say because it's based on what are you looking for. So what I like to say is the best deal is something you can find on sale that you actually need. This year, more than ever, I really want people to make a budget and to make a list of what they want to buy and to make sure those two things are simpatico, meaning you're not spending more than you can afford, and when those bills come due, you're not going to be underwater. That said, if you are looking for toys right now or clothes and you see them on sale, snag them. The things you may want to wait for, Cookware, appliances, electronics, consider waiting until next month. That's traditionally when those things go on sale for Black Friday and around Thanksgiving. Okay, Vicki, and then I have a question for you. You know, if I were ever to buy you a gift on Amazon, right, I would buy the gift, like say it's, I don't know, like a safari print blouse. I would personally wrap it, right? But, but Amazon, they'll do that for you, and now they're going to make it even easier with a new feature, right? You know I love a good animal print, and I will say this is a really interesting feature. If you can text me or email me, which I know you can, you can buy me a gift. This is for Prime members only. So when you go to the checkout, there's a new option for shipping. It's going to say, let the recipient enter their shipping address. That means you buy the gift. I get a notification. Oh, Tom wants to send me something. I can enter a shipping address. Or I can say, you know what? I'd rather have that as a gift card and you would be none the wiser. So this is an interesting new feature. I would never do that. I trust your taste. I would accept any gift from Tom Yamas, but I'm just saying for folks out there, this is a new feature on Amazon for Prime members. I think it's, I think it's brilliant, and I think people are gonna, gonna use it a lot. Vicki, thank you so much. We love having you on Top Story. We learned so much from this segment, uh, especially about what to get you. So you're on the nice list. Santa's gonna be good this year. Thanks so much. When we come back, ranking the richest Americans, Forbes releasing their annual list. Who made the top spots and who was knocked off this year? Hint, one is a former president. Stay with us.
Welcome back. A divorce, crypto, and a presidency have all shaken up this year's list of the richest Americans. And it turns out yachts, Ferraris, and penthouses are no longer the must-have of the rich and famous. It's a spaceship to literally take a trip around the world. Tonight, the nation's ultra-richest only getting richer. Forbes releasing its annual list of the 400 wealthiest Americans. Nearly all are wealthier than they were a year ago. The top 20 billionaires together worth a stunning 1.8 trillion. It's been a great run for, uh, for America's richest people. The number one spot once again belonging to Jeff Bezos for the fourth year in a row. The founder and chairman of online retailer and cloud computing titan Amazon worth $201 billion. The first time anyone on the list has been worth $200 billion or more. To put that in perspective, if you divided Bezos' wealth up and gave a piece of that pie to every American, each person would get around $600. Command and start. Two. What? Bezos making headlines recently for the launch of his rocket, Blue Origin, which successfully took flight in July and is scheduled to make another trip next week with Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner, on board. Another investor in interstellar travel on the list, Elon Musk, now worth $190.5 billion, almost triple what he was worth last year. Falling down the list, Bill Gates clocking in at number four, the first time he hasn't been in one of the top two spots in three decades, a product of his high-profile divorce. But his ex-wife, Melinda French Gates, joining the list for the first time, one of 56 women, that number unchanged from last year. 44 newcomers joined the ranks, the richest of whom is 29-year-old cryptocurrency entrepreneur Sam Bankman-Fried, worth $22.5 billion. He's the youngest member on the list, the richest self-made newcomer in the history of the Forbes 400, joining seven other cryptocurrency billionaires. What's the best way to make a ton of money to give it away? Well, it's crypto. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of other people who I think feel the same way and who are innovating in that space who we will probably see on our uh, billionaire lists here in the years to come. 51 billionaires dropped off the rankings, most notably media mogul Oprah Winfrey and former president Donald Trump, who didn't make the cut for the first time in 25 years. But the list makers say it's not just about who's on it, but also how all these billionaires are spending their money. It's important to hold these people accountable and to really keep a watchful eye on them. That does it for Top Story. I will see you manana. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Goodbye. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.